Hello and welcome to WHO's and today's virtual press conference on COVID-19, the war in Ukraine and other global health emergencies. We are Wednesday, the 4th of May. Simultaneous interpretation is provided in, in the six U, uh, official UN languages, Arabic, Chinese, French, English, Spanish and Russian, plus Portuguese and Hindi. Let me introduce to you the participants in the room are Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus, WHO Director General, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director, Health Emergencies Program, uh, Dr. Kate O'Brien, Director, Immunization Vaccines and Biologicals, Dr. Sumia, Sumia Swaminathan, Chief Scientist, Dr. Sosi Fall, Assistant Director General Emergency Response, and uh, Dr. Uh, um, Abdi Mohammed, who is the incident manager for COVID-19, and joining remotely is uh, Dr. Um, 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 Simao, uh, who is uh, joining us uh, from uh, online. She's Assistant Director General Access to Medicines and Health Products. Recording in progress. Now, without uh, further uh, delay, we'd like to hand over to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. DG, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Fadila. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, globally, Reported cases and deaths from COVID-19 are continuing to decline, with reported weekly deaths at their lowest since March 2020. But these trends, while welcome, don't tell the full story. Driven by Omicron subvariants, we are seeing an increase in reported cases in Americas and Africa. The South African scientists who identified Omicron late last year have now reported two more Omicron subvariants, BA4 and BA5, as the reason for a spike in cases in South Africa. It's too soon to know whether these new subvariants can cause more severe disease than other Omicron subvariants, but early data suggest vaccination remains protective against severe disease and death. The best way to protect people remains vaccination, alongside tried and tested public health and social measures. This is another sign that the pandemic is not done with us, and there are some clear takeaways. First, vaccinating at least 70% of the population of every country, including 100% of the most at-risk groups, remains the best way to save lives protect health systems, and minimize cases of long COVID. Availability of vaccines has improved significantly, but a combination of lack of political commitment, operational capacity problems, financial constraints, and hesitancy due to misinformation and disinformation is limiting demand for vaccines. We urge all countries to address these bottlenecks to provide protection to their populations. Second, testing and sequencing remain absolutely critical. The BA4 and BA5 subvariants were identified because South Africa is still doing the vital genetic sequencing that many other countries have stopped doing. In many countries, we're essentially blind to how the virus is mutating. We don't know what's coming next. Third, I'm troubled that highly effective antivirals are still not accessible to people in low and middle income countries. Low availability and high prices have led some countries to rule out buying these life saving treatments. Act Accelerator partners are engaged in price negotiations to lower prices and increase availability. Coupled with low investment in early diagnosis, it's simply not acceptable that in worst pandemic in a century, innovative treatments that can save lives are not reaching those that need them. We're playing with a fire that continues to burn us. Meanwhile, manufacturers are posting record profits. 
WHO supports fair reward for innovation. But we cannot accept prices that make life-saving treatments available to the rich and out of reach for the poor. This is a moral failing. In three weeks, leaders will come to Geneva for a critically important World Health Assembly. The theme will be, a hell, will be Health for Peace and Peace for Health. With this in mind, tomorrow I will travel to Poland for the International Donors Conference for Ukraine. The health challenges in Ukraine are worsening by the day, especially in the country's east. WHO has now verified 186 attacks on health care in Ukraine. Scores of civilians were able to leave Mariupol yesterday, and WHO and our partners were able to receive them and provide health care. Humanitarian corridors like this are critical to get civilians to safety and health services to those in need. We urge the Russian Federation to allow people to leave Mariupol and other areas where civilians are at great risk. And we continue to call on the Russian Federation to end this war. In the Horn of Africa and the Sahel, the climate crisis, spiking food prices, and food shortages are threatening to cause famine and further insecurity. The Horn of Africa is experiencing its worst drought in 40 years. 15 million people are estimated to be severely food insecure in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia. In Ethiopia, not enough food is reaching those who need it most. Since the declaration of the humanitarian truce in Tigray six weeks ago, just 172 tracks of aid were able to reach the region, representing just 4% of the need. And in Burkina Faso, Repeated attacks on scarce water resources are depriving people of access to the minimum amount of water they need just to survive. Attacks on health care, sieges blocking food and medicine, attacks on water, each is an assault on very foundation of life. And in each case, the only answer is peace. Meanwhile, WHO is supporting vaccination efforts as part of the response to an, an Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So far, 376 contacts have been identified, of which 243 have been vaccinated so far. No new cases or deaths have been reported in the last week, which is encouraging, but our teams remain vigilant. As you can see, WHO is responding to a huge range of challenges around the world. To say nothing of our work outside the emergencies to strengthen health systems and promote the conditions in which people can live healthy lives. All of this work costs money. Last week, a member state working group agreed on a proposal for member states to boost their annual assess contributions to 50% of WHO's core budget by 2028-2029. We welcome this proposal, which will be considered by the World Health Assembly later this month. Finally, tomorrow is World Hand Hygiene Day and the International Day of the Midwife. To mark the day, WHO is launching the first global report on infection prevention and control. The simple act of cleaning hands can save lives, especially in healthcare facilities, where vulnerable patients can be exposed to infection. Out of every 100 patients in acute care hospitals, seven patients in high-income countries, and 15 patients in low- and middle-income countries will acquire at least one health care associated infection during their hospital stay. WHO's new report shows that where good hand hygiene and other cost-effective practices are followed, 70% of those infections can be prevented. For the first time, 
The report provides a global analysis of how infection prevention and control programs are being implemented around the world. So, whether you work in a health facility or not, cleaning your hands regularly can be the difference between life and death for you and for others. Fadila, back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tedros. Uh, let me now open the floor to questions from the media. To get into the queue to ask questions, you need to raise your hand using the raise your hand icon. And do not forget, please, to unmute yourself when it is time for you to speak. Um, I would like now to invite the first reporter, Helen Branswell from STAT. Helen, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Fidela. Um, my question is for Dr. O'Brien. Um, I'm wondering how WHO views to, uh, to boosters at this point in terms of COVID. Is, is the evidence pointing to the, a need for annual boosters? Do you know yet? Thank you. Uh, hi, Helen. I think I'll pass to someone who probably knows a lot more about this than me, uh, Kate O'Brien with us here. Uh, I think Kate is better positioned to answer that question. Thanks for the question. Um, as you know, uh, the uh, recommendations from SAGE are around a full schedule, which includes the primary series doses and booster doses. And this is especially important for the variants that we have right now, Omicron variant in particular. I think your question is about um, beyond having a one booster following the primary immunization schedule, um, what is our recommendation and where do we stand on additional booster doses? So SAGE has reviewed the evidence on this. I want to emphasize that the evidence um, comes largely from a single platform of vaccines, and we have four platforms of vaccines that are available. Um, so the first issue is that we are in a pretty limited space in terms of data. Um, the second is that the evidence um, comes from a limited number of settings, um, and it does point to some benefit, short-term benefit, um, of additional doses uh, against uh, some of the outcomes, in particular against uh, hospitalization. Um, this is a, a really limited set of, of uh, evidence that we have, and we will um, continue to watch this evidence very carefully and come forward with recommendations about how to proceed with additional doses when there is sufficient evidence um, in that direction. I think what SAGE has really focused on and will continue to focus on is the benefit and the um, protection, especially for the severe end of the spectrum and especially for those people who are at higher risk. Um, and that's really where uh, we're going to focus our attention um, and, and we'll, we'll come forward a, a, as soon as we feel that the evidence is sufficient to make some statements around this. Thanks. Yeah, Fidella, I think Ellen may have said O'Brien, uh, Ryan and O'Brien are fairly close together in sound, so um, brother and sister, so uh, sorry, Helen, for mishearing you. The, your voice was uh, fading in and out as you asked the question. Thank you. Dr. Swaminathan, you have the floor. Just to add to what uh, Kate has said, uh, Helen, I think uh, this also points to the need for more data. She mentioned that most of the data is on the mRNA uh, vaccines, most of the data is coming from high-income countries. We really need more data on vaccine effectiveness and the duration of that uh, vaccine uh, effectiveness uh, in different populations with different kinds of exposure to the virus, but also using different kinds of vaccines, inactivated vaccines, the viral vectored vaccines, and so on. So again, a plea to countries to not stop surveillance. There are, uh, WHO has methodology that's been put out, uh, standard methods for doing vaccine effectiveness studies that can be used, uh, that can be implemented. And this will be useful also for studies of other uh, vaccine-preventable diseases. So thinking about you know, these integrated surveillance platforms and also ways of studying uh, vaccine effectiveness in the population, I think that's the only way to help answer these questions as to whether or not uh, annual boosters will be needed. Um, the WHO also has uh, the committee, two committees, in fact, the TAG-VE, which looks at uh, the evolution of the of the virus and and how significant that is in terms of its uh, impact on on disease outcomes, but also the tag COVAC that is looking at at the composition of the vaccines and whether there is enough evidence to to indicate that we may need a change in vaccine composition. So 
Along with SAGE, these bodies uh, are constantly updating themselves, but you know, they can only make decisions based on good data. And so again, a plea for more research. And of course, again, a whole area of research that's ongoing that we must continue to support is the new vaccines, especially the inhaled vaccines, mucosal vaccines, which could build up a different type of immunity uh, that could perhaps be more effective at, uh, at stopping infections. And also, of course, the, the pan-coronavirus uh, vaccines, which, which would be, uh, for the long term, I think, really worth investing in those platforms. Thanks, Fidela. Thank you. Uh, next question goes to Carmen Pohn from Politico. Carmen, can you hear me? Yes, Fidela, thank you so much for giving me the floor. Um, a bit following up on the previous question, um, the leaders of the FDA wrote this week in JAMA that they think um, COVID vaccination will become seasonal, uh, very much like the flu, and that there should be a decision probably by June about the composition of these vaccines um, that should be more tailored to respond to circulating variants. And I just wanted to get the WHO's view on that. Do you, do you agree with that view? And if so, what does this mean for the rest of the world, uh, given where we are with COVID vaccination? Thank you. Dr. O'Brien. Um, I haven't seen the, the piece in JAMA from the FDA, but the issues that you're describing um, are relevant, especially for where we are with um, vaccine coverage uh, around the world. And I think the first thing that we have to address is that um, uh, identifying, you know, the need for booster doses, uh, the frequency of booster doses, whether this is seasonal or non-seasonal, is all predicated um, on uh, 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 an environment where people have received their primary doses first. And that is first and foremost what is most protective um, against, uh, against COVID. So I think we have to recognize the remarkable progress that's being made on getting primary doses um, into those who are most vulnerable uh, around the world. Uh, the supply is uh, available for countries um, around the world to achieve the ambitions that they have uh, for protection of the population. Um, and the delivery really is advancing um, as, as rapidly as countries are able to stand up that delivery. But there's still quite a ways to go in terms of uh, achieving primary vaccination uh, in every country around the world, and first and foremost against the highest priority groups. And so just, you know, sort of uh, taking our, our look at healthcare workers and those over 60 as two of the highest priority groups, um, there is... Um, very good progress, uh, but we're still at less than 50% primary coverage in some regions of the world for those priority groups. So really, prim primary vaccination, um, those primary doses, is what is uh, essential at this point, and the advancement and speeding of uh, delivering those doses, especially to the highest priority groups, is, is the top priority. The question of whether or not um, there will be then seasonal boosters um, whether or not the composition of the vaccine should be modified to account for um, variations in the, in the virus. Again, as Sumya described, we have expert committees that are addressing the composition of the vaccine, the TAG-COVAC. Um, and I think the focus of that committee is very much on the performance of the existing vaccines against various outcomes. Um, and certainly we've seen that the performance of the existing vaccines against these variants is um, not strong against the infection, the mild end of the disease uh, spectrum, and especially against infections that are asymptomatic and nevertheless um, are part of transmission. So they will continue to work and look at the evidence and come out with advice on the composition of the vaccines. And I think that's one of the really critical roles for WHO and for this committee is that we have uh, a, a coordinated view of what uh, will make up the, the best uh, composition of vaccines rather than having uh, a dispersed set of decisions that uh, will create quite a chaotic landscape of availability of vaccines. So those, I think, are some of the issues that are being considered. Um, and uh, we'll be interested to see the, uh, the piece from uh, the FDA in JAMA that you referred to. Thank you. And just on the issue of um, um, seasonality, uh, viruses, when they first emerge in human populations, tend to be very erratic in how they how they 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 they, they transmit and, and the the epidemic curves that they create. Over time, 
it settles into a pattern. And the, the balance all the time is between the level of population protection, how protected are the population from the virus, are they vaccinated, have they had a previous infection, uh, how effective the vaccine is in reducing transmission, for example. Um, and that's always balanced against the efficiency of transmission. And the efficiency of transmission right now, you can clearly see with the variants, BA1, 2, 4, 5, you're seeing that increased efficiency of virus transmission, but also the environment in which the virus is transmitting. In other words, are people indoors? Is it cold? Are people close together? So all of these factors come together. The level of population protection, the efficiency of virus transmission, which is a factor of the virus, and then the conditions in which people are interacting and whether the virus transmission is promoted. You can imagine over uh, what we see with influenza viruses and others, that in those winter type colder conditions where you see uh, people moving indoors, you see that influenza can take off in the northern and southern hemisphere when people come inside and mix more and there's more transmission. Uh, however, in the middle part of the world, right across the tropics, there is no seasonal pattern in influenza. So this perception that respiratory viruses ultimately settle into a seasonal pattern is not true. It depends where you are. It depends whether the population is vaccinated or not, and it depends whether new variants are actually emerging. So there are a lot of factors that still need to play out uh, for us to determine whether this virus is truly going to become a seasonal um, occurrence. But what is true is if you've got low population protection, if people are uh, crowded together in, 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 in conditions where a new variant is spreading, you will see high levels of transmission, whether that's uh, in winter or summer. So I think the, the jury is still out as to how seasonal this virus will become. But certainly we would expect in northern and southern hemispheres that in the context of relatively high protection, if the virus doesn't continue to evolve um, uh, tremendously in terms of its transmissibility, that the virus will tend to transmit more at times when people are closer together. Because the virus is trying to survive, it's trying to move from person to person. It's more efficient at doing that when people are closer together when people are packed in, when ventilation is poor, it's winter time, you don't open the windows. So there's a lot of factors that will drive transmission in winter conditions. Thank you. Um, I would like now to invite Jules Coussement from Tokyo Broadcast Service to ask the next question. Jules, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Go ahead, please. Yes, thank you for uh, taking my question. Um, I just wanted to know if you had any update about the acute hepatitis uh, case. Um, did they? Did you had any other information about uh, new countries being concerned by that, or uh, any news about the the, the disease uh, origin? Thank you. Thanks so much, Jules. I believe we have our expert, doc Dr. Abdi who will take this question, but we have also uh, Dr. Philippa Esterbrook, uh, who is joining us online. Uh, Dr. Esterbrook, do you want to take this question and then we can supplement if uh, any of my colleagues would like to, to add. Uh, Dr. Esterbrook, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Um, well, since the first report from the UK on April 5th, um, as of May 1st, uh, 2022, there are now at least 228 uh, probable cases uh, reported from 20 countries. Um, and there are above 50 that are now under investigation. Um, and we now have cases, therefore, reported from five WHO regions, so the Eastern Mediterranean, the European, um, the uh, Pan American, and Syro, the Southeast Asian, and Western Pacific region also. Um, but it's important to highlight that six, only six of the countries are reporting more than five cases. And the other 14 countries are reporting less than five, and in some cases, just one or two, two cases. We still have uh, reported um, one death um, and around 18 liver transplants that were performed. And in terms of an update on investigations as to the underlying cause, um, as we've uh, we've emphasized before, we are looking at all possible infectious and non-infectious uh, causes. 
And I think what we can report is reinforcing some of the messages made last week that still apply in terms of what does not seem to be uh, causing the uh, acute hepatitis. And that is, again, that none of the common viruses that uh, are associated with acute hepatitis, that's A to E, but also some other viruses, the glandular fever virus, um, cytomegalovirus, uh, are associated. And that from the detailed questionnaires uh, of possible exposures, it still applies that there's no link to one geographic area or common exposure to particular foods or animals, um, travel or to toxins. And then again, to reiterate that the uh, question about a link to COVID vaccines um, are not supported, as still the majority of children, especially the younger age groups, had not received the vaccine. I think everyone's aware of the possible link to adenovirus um, as, as one of the possible hypotheses based on a proportion of cases, uh, and most of the testing has been done in the UK, that 72 out of 84 tested were positive for adeno. Um, and that at the same time, some of the countries had reported an uptick in their community transmission of, of adenovirus. I think what is um, a, a considerable progress has been made over the last uh, week has been with some special investigations. Um, and these are a comprehensive set of in-depth studies uh, to really complement what's already known and to drill down a little bit more into the key hypothesis, particularly about whether adenovirus really is a cause uh, of the hepatitis and not just an incidental finding. And these investigations, I'll just briefly summarize, fall into three main groups, and they're very comprehensively described in the technical report from the UK on the UK HSA website, page number 30. And the three groups are investigations of the pathogen, so looking in detail at the, the virus with uh, uh, detailed sequencing, then secondly, looking at the children in more detail, uh, we call these host studies, and that includes looking at the immune response in more detail and their genetics to see if this may, might explain why they've developed more severe disease. And then the third group, um, they're called analytic studies, and I think one of the most important ones here is a case control study that is comparing the rate of detection of adenovirus in the hospitalized children with liver disease with other groups of hospitalized children. And this study is just starting, uh, led by UKHSA, and results will be available soon. And I think the results of these investigations uh, and uh, others that are outlined in their report will be extremely helpful in um, informing other planned studies and involving other countries. And we've already been meeting with an, a number of the key networks uh, to plan ahead for these multi-country studies once we have more information from the UK. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Esther Brook. I would like now to invite um, a journalist from today's News Africa, who is not Simon Ateba, but Sarah Dwyer. Sarah, you have the floor. Hey, thank you so much for answering, for taking my question. Can you hear me all right? Very well. Go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. So my question is to the Director General. You said earlier that South Africa has identified two new subvariants of the Omicron variant. How transmissible are these and do the current vaccines work against them? And then also if you can comment on what you would like to see from President Biden's summit on hunger coming this September, since there is with all the hunger in the Horn of Africa, as was described earlier. Thank you, Sarah. I would like to invite Dr. Abdi to take your first question. Thanks. As Director General has said, we really appreciate the excellent work uh, by the South Africa scientists, both the epidemiological, the clinical, and the laboratory, uh, for the first discovering, uh, sharing the data of the Omicron B1, and also subsequently BA4 and BA5. The good news so far is that they have done an excellent laboratory report, Alex, and I want to shout out from here all the results and the timely results and then sharing that result 
So what they did in the initial preliminary report had they compared people who have been vaccinated and got the B1 and for those people who have not been vaccinated and that. So the excellent result shows a good neutralization for those who have been vaccinated and may or may not have gotten. So as Director General have said, the current vaccine that available as long as you have vaccinated, still vaccines work and vaccines saves life. So we are also be reporting in other countries, not limited to South Africa. It's only South Africa is looking for the virus, looking, actively looking, and then coordinating the data available. So we know very well it's just a matter of time before this variant becomes replace each other as they try to compete. So I just want to reiterate again the, the great work done by the South Africa scientists and the reassurance that the vaccines still work and still saves life. Thank you, Dr. Abdi. Dr. Ryan? Um, DG may speak to the specific issue of, of the summit, but it's, it's, it's fantastic to see uh, global leaders really coming out now and, and addressing the issue of, of world hunger. We've seen, uh, continued to see, and as the DG said in his speech, the impact on both water and food supplies of the, the multiple crises across the Sahel and the Horn of Africa, driven by conflict, uh, to a great extent driven by climate change, and, um, and increasingly the, la the, the remote effects of that, the war uh, in Ukraine, is driving huge issues with food supplies elsewhere in the world. Food prices are spiking. So we have huge issues in the food markets, huge issues in food production, huge issues in food equity within countries. Um, and it's driving huge issues of ill health. Uh, hunger is, is a major risk factor for many, many other diseases, particularly for infectious diseases and outcomes in other uh, important infectious diseases, particularly, particularly for children with underlying um, uh, uh, malnutrition and stunting is, 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 is very poor. So food and water, as the DG said, they're the, the, the core of life. Well, peace, food, and water. These are the things that our, 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 our uh, people have survived on for millennia. Uh, the absence of food, uh, the absence of food at an affordable price that doesn't impoverish, the absence or the, the presence of nutritious food that allows children to grow healthily. So it's not just the amount of food, it's the content in that food, it's the price of that food. Uh, President Biden bringing the world together to address this is a very, very meaningful act at this very fragile time on our planet. I uh, don't know if the DG wants to supplement. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mike had, uh, I think, uh, covered it, but I will uh, just add a few few points. Uh, one, uh, as we speak, hunger is on the, ri on the rise. And uh, last year's estimate shows that 9.9% uh, .9 of the world population is, is affected. And that's, that's really big, say 10 percent. Um, and people affected by famine, for instance, if you take the extreme, is 45 million people. This is, again, end of last year's es uh, estimate. Uh, and from the announcement, um, I think one thing which is the Biden administration's uh, assignment, uh, announcement to have this summit in, in September, I think is timely. Uh, because, as you know, uh, eradicating or ending hunger uh, is part of the SDG goals uh, for, for, for 2030. And as you also know, uh, that we are um, not on schedule. I mean, uh, we're not on track uh, with regard to almost all, all SDGs, especially hunger. And as Mike said, um, and the war now uh, in Ukraine uh, is further complicating uh, the uh, hunger situation. So you would have hunger more on the rise, and uh, you know risk of famine also we expect to increase. Uh, so with regard to both SDGs uh, and also the current acute problems we are facing. Uh, because of the war. I think the um, summit on hunger, nutrition and health that's planned by President Biden in, in, in September is, is uh, timely. Um, and uh, uh, as, you, as you may know, uh, this is actually also the first uh, since 1969 doing the same thing in, in, in the White House. 
Uh, of course, it's coming after 50 years, but I hope uh, this, uh, this uh, summit will be, um, you know, the reactivation of, of that summit, but hopefully that will be maintained uh, to achieve uh, the SDG goals. So I, we, we need to see it in relation to the SDG goals and the acute problems we're seeing now due to uh, the war. Uh, so thank you, and Fadila. Thank you, DG. I would like now to invite Shoko Koyama from NSK to ask the next question. Hello, Fadila. Can you hear me? Very well. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you very much for taking my question. Um, it's a follow-up question on hepatitis. Uh, I understand the cases of the, uh, the, the causes of the cases still remains very much under active investigation. But what should the general public should worry about at this stage? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shoko. Uh, Dr. Esterbrook. Uh, thank you. Um, I think it's important to emphasize that uh, this is still a rare event and that stomach bugs and vomiting diarrhea occur not uncommonly in children and only a very small proportion would ever progress to this, um, as I said, rare uh, event with liver failure and other complications. Um, I think it's important for, for parents to be uh, aware and that if their child has persistent symptoms or develops jaundice with yellow eyes and pale stools to then certainly seek medical advice. And in the meantime, until we fully understand um, the causes um, and the infectious agent, if indeed that is going to be the case, then basic principles of good hygiene and hand washing um, should apply as they should for any um, gastroenteritis uh, stomach upset. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Dr. Abdi would like to add a few uh, information. No, uh, Dr. Subrook has covered the main thing, the basic tomorrow is an hygiene day, but also the childhood vaccination the chances of a lot of catching up and making sure all children are updated and contacting your primary pediatrician is the first thing. So I think as the doctor said, we are still investigating as a rare event, but there's a lot of intervention under the control of the parent that can do those interventions of making sure that the primary immunization is updated, the primary hand hygiene is that can prevent and saves life. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abdi. Um, Dr. Swaminathan? Just a quick addition, uh, because there is um, some vaccine misinformation that's uh, circulated around the association between COVID vaccines and hepatitis. And I think, as Dr. Easterbrook mentioned, majority of the children who've been reported with this unusual hepatitis have not had a, a COVID vaccine. So at, at this point, there doesn't seem to be any relationship whatsoever. And, and so if things are circulating, it's, it's more misinformation than based on facts. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Swaminathan. We are uh, coming to uh, the end of our press conference. We will be sending you the DG opening remarks and the audio file uh, just after this press conference. Now I would like to hand over to Dr. Tedros for his closing remarks. DG, have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Fadila. And thank you to all uh, members of the press for joining us uh, today and see you next time.